Hello there, everybody. I'm hoping that you can see me and hear me. Uh, this is my first time doing a broadcast with a webcam, a little bit new to me. So I've been on stage in front of thousands of people before and not broken a sweat. And uh, I feel a little little tinge of apprehension about this just because um, hoping the technology does not betray me. So um, we'll see how that goes. I don't have the camera optimally positioned. So a lot of the time I'm going to look like I'm looking up like this because that's what I need to do to see the screen. But um, with successive broadcasts, we'll get better with that. I'm also using a, a brand new uh, platform uh, that I haven't used. Audio sounds good, good to hear. Um, I'm using a new platform called StreamYard that lets me broadcast to Facebook Live and to Twitch at the same time. Um, so that is going to be very useful to me going forward, but um, this will be a sort of a rough um, sound check, if you will, not really a sound check, dress rehearsal. That's the phrase I was going for. Uh, so it's not going to be quite as perfect as I'd like, but um, we'll see how it goes. So looks like we have some folks in the room already. And um, I'll just give you a little bit of a brief background about myself that will maybe um, tell you a little bit about my interest in travel. As many of you may know, I'm not from America originally. I'm actually an immigrant. I'm from the Bahamas, which is a small island chain, uh, very close to Florida, very, very close to Florida. And when I was growing up, all I wanted to do was move to America. That was all I was interested in. And um, I had visited several times, mostly in Florida. Um, and it was just amazing to me the whole the whole everything all of it stores were open on sunday mail got delivered to your house just crazy things that we didn't have and couldn't dream of um you know and a letter took a couple of days to get where it was going instead of maybe reaching you in a couple of weeks if you were lucky um so that was the extent of my ambition really was just to move to this country and find opportunity and um, you know make a make a way for myself make a, a a job or a business or something and um, once I got here um, I had the advantage of being um, exposed to uh, a greater number of well, things just seems like a poor choice of words, but uh, um, I became interested in the world, the greater world. And I, I do want to say that when I was in the Bahamas, um, as so to give you a sense, the island that I lived on, there's 700 islands in the Bahamas, and I think about 30 of them are inhabited, and maybe 80 to 85 percent of the people live on one island, which was not the island I live on. Um, so probably more people live in the Maniunk section of Philadelphia than lived on the island that I, I come from. Um, but there were some foreign workers that um, were in senior positions at the uh, oil refinery and at the chemical plant. And as it happened, their kids went to the school that I went to. So I had an Egyptian best friend growing up for a number of years. Um, there were some Pakistani girls at my school. So my experience wasn't really the small town America homogenous kind of experience. Um, it was a very different experience, um, which we'll get into another time or maybe not. But the point is, you know, I, I had uh, already sort of gotten a sense that there was there was a wider world out there. Um, but once I came to the U.S., I was uh, exposed to much more of it through music, through books, through television, and um, 
I became interested in the world. I think music was really my my sort of gateway drug um, to the the world at large. And I would say that um, Germany was sort of a a, a starting point for me. Um, I don't know that that's the first foreign country I visited, but it's the one I've probably visited the most. And uh, obviously working with Gothic and industrial music on a professional level, so much of it comes from Germany that I'm familiar with that aspect of German music. But in the course of traveling to Germany and being there and absorbing the culture, um, I became interested in other aspects of German music like Neue Deutsche Welle, which is sort of like the German equivalent of New Wave. Um, and German hip hop, as most of you know, is a passion of mine. And I'll be playing some of that later on. Um, but um, music was really what opened up the world to me and made me interested in going places. And um, so I have been all over the place. There are people who have been to more places than I've been. I haven't been everywhere by a long shot. Uh, but I think if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, I'm not sure that how that would happen since I'm in quarantine, but if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, um, I could probably die happy saying that I had seen um, a great big chunk of the world. So we're going to be talking about some of those places. Um, I will take your questions on any of the places that I've been to, but uh, the, the three that people seem to be most interested in are Iran, where I was last year in the summer, uh, North Korea, where I was about, I want to say eight to 10 years ago, and Cuba, where I was maybe six or seven years ago. And um, I'll start with Cuba just because it's, it's the easiest one to explain. Um, as a Bahamian, uh, I could go to Cuba any time that I wanted to. We had daily flights from Freeport to Havana. So there was uh, never any mystique to it necessarily for me. But then once I moved to the States, um, that complicated things a bit. And many of you will remember Shampoo Nightclub, or maybe some of you won't. But uh, I used to do a lot of shows there. And some of the people that owned Shampoo uh, owned a Cuban restaurant that still exists here in Philly called Cuba Libre. And they were doing a foodie tour of Cuba. And it was all legit and above board because it had been approved as a people to people program. So uh, I wanted to go and I wound up going um, right out of Miami in the regular airport on a legitimate flight, no kind of sneaking or skulking around and um, uh, spent about a week in Cuba. Um, and of course we did touristy things, which were wonderful. We went to um, a rum distillery, which was not interesting to me, a cigar place, which was not interesting to me, but then, you know, Ernest Hemingway's um, home and that's uh, certainly an interesting tidbit of history. And we went to a traditional Cuban variety show, which was really fantastic. Um, and uh, we got stuffed. We, we were just given um, so much food um, that uh, I think by the third day or so, I, I just had to say, no, you know, no mas. Um, which is not to say I stopped altogether, but um, that uh, they just, they wanted to bring out their best. And the government restaurants there are very hit or miss. We went to a very nice one. Uh, we had an excellent uh, guide. One of the chefs from Cuba Libre, who is from Cuba, uh, was our tour leader. And mostly though we visited what the uh, the Cuban government in, well, recent, about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, they started allowing people to open up little restaurants in their home. 
and uh, there's restrictions to how many people can be there at one time. It could only seat, I want to say, maybe 20 people at maximum, and there's a few other rules about how they're allowed to do what they do, but some of these uh, in-home restaurants are just stunning, and the technique and the food preparation are amazing, the flavors are delicious, and they really wanted to show off, um, hi, um, they really wanted to show off the best of, of what they had to offer. So um, I ate a lot. I definitely put on some pounds there. So um, I want to just sort of open up to questions. There might not be any yet, but if somebody has a question that they want to post, I'll do my best to address it. And if not, then uh, I might try to show you a video. So I'll wait a moment and see if anybody has anything general they want to ask or about any of the places that I've mentioned. I'll try to give you a, a rundown of some of the places that I've been to. I will not remember all of them, but uh, let's see, Canada, um, Brazil, Peru, Norway, Sweden, Germany, um, Turkey, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, specifically Abu Dhabi, very briefly, and Dubai for a longer period, uh, China several times, um, North Korea, um, Iran, um, geez, I'm sure I'm missing a whole chunk in there, Ireland, the Dominican Republic, um, I didn't really go around the Caribbean too much because you've seen one island, you've kind of seen them all to some extent. Uh, Spain was fantastic. I went to Spain uh, two years ago, and uh, that was uh, that was quite excellent. Um, so I don't see any specific questions popping up. So I'm going to try to get this video up. We'll see how. Oh, we have a question. When you're traveling abroad, what's the most frequent question you get about America? Um, that's, that's varied depending on where I've been and when I've been there. Um, since the current administration has come into power, uh, there have been a lot of political questions. Uh, people have asked me about how the American political process works, how we elect people, um, why someone can win the popular vote but not necessarily win the presidency. And in Iran, as you can imagine, the questions were more specific about um, American policies as they relate to the um, sanctions on Iran, but I, I wouldn't say there's um, there's been a, a most common question. Um, I think people look at me and realize that I probably don't live a typical American life, so I think probably the idea of asking me um, what's life like in America um, they may, they may figure I don't know any better than they do because I'm obviously an odd duck. Um, uh, North Korea is really the only place where, where that was sort of a, a more common question was people were just uh, very interested in what my, um, what anybody's day to day was in America, what our, our life was like. I remember we were at a, uh, we were at a public park on a holiday, it was the uh, anniversary of their uh, liberation, their independence from Japanese occupation. And um, they were cooking out and dancing in the park. And um, one of the guides that was with us said, well, you know, what do you guys do when you have a holiday? And I said, well, you know, so we, we cook out too. And, you know, usually in the backyard, some people might go to a park and, uh, he said, but you sing, right? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, everybody gets together to sing, right? And I said, no, we don't really do that unless, you know, unless there's 
a lot of alcohol involved. Um, we don't really do the group singing thing in America. He was very surprised by that. So, um, oh, we have another question here. So let me pop that up on the screen. Um, how often do I get to share my musical loves when I travel and how has it been received? Um, and what sounds have I been introduced to that I would like to share? So, um, sharing music requires um, an ability to play it. Um, and if I'm in a, a car with somebody, as I was in Iran, um, it was just me and my guide. It was just the two of us. So, and we had a lot, there was a lot of driving involved. We covered a lot of territory. Um, so we had a lot of time in the car and I played a lot of different music for him. Um, and he was, you know, iffy on the goth industrial stuff. Um, oddly enough, the, the industrial thing that, I don't know that it's odd, I don't know why I said that, but interestingly enough, the industrial thing that really excited him was uh, When Is the Future by the NV Nation. Um, he really liked that song a lot. And I played him some earlier VNV Nation that was, you know, kind of harder, um, you know, more of what you would think of industrial and less of the kind of uh, future pop um, direction that they later went into. And he, he wasn't really interested in that. I played him some ministry and he said, oh, they're, they're so angry. Um, and of the goth stuff, he was most interested in um, Dead Can Dance and Irfan and similar bands like that. Um, some of the bands with really pretty ethereal female vocals. Um, when I was in North Korea, I didn't have the opportunity to directly share music with people. But what I did was before I went, I bought two um, very small MP3 players. Um, they each only held maybe two gigs, uh, I guess. And um, I gave them as uh, surreptitious um, parting gifts to uh, two of the guides. And uh, I had filled it with uh, what I called a brief history of Western music. And uh, if you go back uh, on my Facebook page, there are... Um, some notes back when notes were still a thing on Facebook. And I posted a note that had the complete listing of songs that I put in there. And given the space constraints, it was really difficult to sort of uh, pick out what songs you wanted to include because it uh, was not just, uh, hey, here's goth industrial music. This is what I do for a living. It was sort of like, this is you know, this is Western music, and th there's just no way to include all of it. Um, you know, I, I don't think Chubby Checker was on there. I, I don't think the Beach Boys were on there. Um, but uh, there were some unsigned goth bands on there and um, uh, some interesting oldies and just kind of all over the map. So uh, that was, for me, an interesting experience. I, I have no idea how it was received. Um, you don't really get to stay in communication with your guides in North Korea. So um, I don't know how much interest they had in how much of it or any of it. Um, but um, so that, you know, that was that was an interesting sharing of music experience. Um, and as far as sounds that I've been introduced to, uh, that'll be eight to 10, I will, I will share some of the music that I've, I've picked up um, in my travels. And um, in some cases, it's been things that I've discovered while I've been in country. And in some of the uh, other cases, it's just been, I've been back here in the US and I've felt like, uh, let's see what's new in, in Persian hip hop today and, and check out some of that or, um, you know, let's find some good Russian choral music. And uh, um, so there'll be there'll be plenty of time to share that um, in the eight to 10 block. 
Uh, I have a, a partial question. I'm not quite sure how to answer. How has traveling affected the way you create? Um, I guess maybe be more specific because I, not sure I would call myself a creator um, in the traditional sense. I don't make music, I, I don't make art, um, but I do make events. Um, uh, so maybe you meant something else, I don't know. Um, and here's somebody else just, uh, yes, my, my, my list of Western music is definitely still out there. Uh, you might have to dig a little on my profile page to find um, my my list of what I left on those MP3 players, but it is still on Facebook. So let me try this. We're going to put the Machu Picchu photo back up. Here's me making a friend at Machu Picchu. I'm going to take a drink off camera because I sound a little raspy. <clears throat> Pardon me, sorry about that, folks. So, um, yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of cloud cover there on Machu Picchu. And uh, this little guy is used to visitors, so he is absolutely not worried about me being there. Um, but um, Machu Picchu um, is one of the seven wonders of the modern world, according to... I don't know, something, a poll, a survey, a study, somebody decided. And um, I would eventually like to get to all of them. I've been to uh, Petra in Jordan, uh, which is another one of them. Uh, Cristo Redentor, or as it's called in English, Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil. Um, Great Wall of China. Uh, I believe Hagia Sophia in Turkey is on that list. Um, and if it's not, it should be. Uh, but I will get to all of them eventually. But I did did want to do Machu Picchu. And um, now let's see if I can get this. So take a look at this LED screen from North Korea, this huge, huge LED screen. And I'll explain what you're seeing um, as you're looking at it. So. Um, this is from something in North Korea called the Mass Games, and they don't do them every year, uh, but when they do them, they are quite literally the greatest show on earth. I have seen a lot of amazing things, both here in the States and in my travels abroad. Um, I've seen, I mean, Cirque du Soleil to me is one of the uh, pinnacles of of production, just in terms of performance and art and everything else. And uh, after I had seen the Mass Games, um, I still love Cirque du Soleil, but uh, you, you just can't beat this. So it's held in the largest stadium in the world, which is actually in North Korea. Uh, I think they have something on the order of 50 to 100,000 performers. I probably should have looked that up before I decided to do this broadcast, but they have an immense number of performers. And uh, as you can see, synchronization is a big part of the show. Um, synchronization is kind of a popular thing in, in a lot of parts of Asia, um, but for the mass games, uh, synchronization is a really big deal. Um, and just look at the sheer number of people there um, doing all the various things that they're doing. And uh, I'm going to talk to you more about the LED screen the next time that it pops up. So you see it there. Well, we saw it briefly in the background there. Um, I'll wait until it uh, does a little scenery change or something. But uh, the LED screen is is really fascinating. So the uh, the show um goes through all sorts of themes they present different aspects of korean culture there's a big taekwondo demonstration there's gymnastics um there are presentations of korean folklore reunification is a very big part of the mass game story um they have a very moving um 
live uh, show of it, and there's there's even a video that they play that uh, that really drives the point home. Um, North Korea, South Korea too, to an extent, but North Korea is very big on reunification with the South, and um, a, a lot of families were split apart when the country was split apart, um, and so reunification is is um, a very uh, emotional subject for a lot of people. Um, here you see some more gymnastics. So uh, the next shot of the LED screen, whether it's changing or not, I'm going to tell you about it because it's very um, it's very interesting. Just again, look at the sheer number of people involved um, in putting on this show. Um, this is a little high wire acrobatic thing. Uh, this is all the way at the top of the stadium. Here's a girl twirling on a string, um, and there's a dramatic moment coming up, and um, and I think here it is. Whoa, there she goes, all the way down. And if you think that's a shortfall, you are sadly mistaken. Okay, so here's the LED screen. The thing about the LED screen is that it's not an LED screen. It is actually tens of thousands of school children, and each of them are holding up a card. Do you see how it just changed there in the background? They're each holding up a card with a color on it. Um, and I'm going to pause just because this is a, uh, I'll finish that story um, before we move on to the next little part of that video. But each student holds up a, an L, a, a, a card, just a plain old piece of cardboard that's a particular color and they flip them and depending on where you're sitting which seat number you're in as a student you flip a certain sequence of cards in a certain order as you are directed by the person who's overseeing your little section and so the synchronization you see on the field is certainly stunning but the synchronization involved in all those school children flipping those cards to make the images that you saw in the background, um, that to me was, was probably even more mind blowing. Um, they had sequences of, of a train moving up a hill. They had little twinkling um, stars for a nighttime scene. It was just fascinating. And, um, I think adults would find it challenging to, uh, to, to, to be able to pull off a sequence like that. And uh, to certainly to see uh, school kids doing it, just to see it at all, just uh, really mind blowing. So I don't see any more questions popping up. So I'm gonna play a little bit more of this uh, North Korean video. And the next thing that you're gonna see is the uh, ever popular DMZ. This is where the country is divided north from south. And um, so if you've heard about the, the heavily guarded, heavily fortified, big, bad, dangerous DMZ, here it is. Um, now, this is right as you come into the DMZ, they have some uh, posters. And now bear in mind, again, I'm on the North Korean side of the DMZ. And they have exhibits that show you how the DMZ is laid out. Um, they have the, um, here's a nice uh, gentleman from the military to explain what it is that we're seeing. Um, they have some of the rooms where the negotiations to uh, bring a halt to hostilities were, uh, were conducted in. And interestingly, the, uh, Korean War never ended. Um, it's still actually technically going. Uh, America and North Korea are technically still in a state of war. Uh, this is where all the, the final declarations were signed. Uh, so we paused the war with an armistice, but we never actually declared it over. And um, that's something that has been discussed in the past year or so as uh, the current administration has, has made diplomatic overtures uh, to North Korea 
there's been some discussion that maybe uh, an olive branch we could extend to them would be finally saying, um, hey, the war's over, which, uh, you know, it's been quite a long time. So um, maybe uh, maybe that would be a good idea. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is the tour group uh, just kind of strolling around the, the DMZ. Um, we were told that they typically uh, stagger it so that there isn't a tour group uh, on the South Korean side at the same time as there is a tour group on the North Korean side, um, which is, I don't know, I was kind of looking forward to the opportunity to to wave at somebody and say, hey, I'm, I'm on the North Korean side. This is, I think, much more interesting than your tour, but, uh, you know, that uh, that didn't happen, uh, which, is, which is fine. So... Um, I think we we missed the shot to uh, to explain their guard setup there, but uh, this is so this is the room that uh, ha the the northern half of the room is technically in North Korea, and the southern half of the room is uh, technically in South Korea. So you can walk around a table there and um, cross over the border. So uh, I mean it's a very technical legalese thing um but so we crossed the the border into the south by walking around the table and then crossed back into uh north korea um when we were when we were done so um that that was fun um all right let's just take a look at a couple of um just a couple of scenes. This is just a, a, a nice day out. People uh, have rented boats. We're on a we're on a little boat cruise, having a, a spot of lunch, just enjoying being out on the water. Uh, I was kind of on the warmer side when I was there, so um, uh, being out in the in the breeze was nice for us. This is the uh, Pyongyang Metro. This is the underground uh, subway line. And the uh, station that we went to is absolutely beautiful. Um, and one of the interesting things about North Korea is that um, you just never, you're never 100% certain of what's uh, completely true. Um, here's me with some uh, railway attendants. Um, and there are stories that uh, all of the metro is that lovely. There are stories that they only have one or two nice stations that they show to tourists. Um, and uh, which of those things is true, I, I can't tell you. Um, I can tell you that both of the stations I saw were very nice. We, we took a short ride from one place to another. Um, you know, there are certainly some uh, stops along the L that are nicer than others uh, here in Philadelphia. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if if maybe some of the uh, some of the stops that uh, are seen more by tourists and that are in nicer areas um, are more developed uh, and prettier than than some of the uh, other ones. But um, uh, so here's an interesting question that I, I, I have a sad answer to. Did I get any exposure to North Korean music culture? And the answer is no. Um, there's, there's not a lot of opportunity for that. Um, typically in North Korea, what you have the opportunity to be exposed to are... Um, if you're going to a show like the Mass Games, um, or maybe uh, if you're at the Pyongyang Circus for a little bit, um, you might hear some traditional folk songs. And that's nice. I like that. Love traditional folk music anywhere in the world. Um, but most of what we would think of as, as contemporary music um, is is mostly political in nature, um, and uh, you don't really hear much of that uh, as a tourist. Um, 
there nowadays there's much more um, there's much more outside music that makes makes its way into North Korea as it's become easier to put so much material on a tiny uh, SIM card or a USB stick. Um, if people have brought in uh, K-pop from South Korea, J-pop from Japan, and uh, just, you know, music from everywhere. Um, but that's, you know, not the sort of thing that you would be blasting out of your uh, car if you were lucky enough to own a car. Um, you know, that's the sort of thing you would kind of be secretly um, indulging in at home um, with your family, probably not with your friends. Um, but uh, no, unfortunately, I, I really didn't get to absorb much music culture there. Um, but I will play a, a traditional uh, Korean folk song. Um, I, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but close enough. It's uh, called Arirang. And um, uh, I'll play that later on in the 8 to 10 block. Um, did I feel scared or nervous in North Korea? No, it was actually one of the, uh, it's the, the safest I've felt in my entire life, uh, or close to it. Let's say pretty close to it. Um, here, here at home, uh, with a few guns in the house is probably when I feel the safest, but, um, North Korea is pr pretty high up there and I'll explain why. Um, North Korea, um, as, as you know, is crippled by uh, sanctions, primarily led by the United States, uh, not exclusively, but primarily. And um, they are a cash-strapped nation. And one of the things that brings hard currency, meaning you know, paper money, into the country is tourism. And so they've been very keen to develop their tourist uh, industry uh, for some time now. And so they really, really want you to enjoy yourself there. And they want you to come back and they want you to tell other people that you had a good time. And they do everything that they reasonably can to facilitate that. So. I'm paranoid by nature and I'm a very cautious traveler. Um, but even here in, in Philly at home, um, I'm paranoid by nature. And by the second day in North Korea, um, when the tour bus would come to a stop and we would get off, I would just leave my laptop um, in, in my seat on the tour bus. And you know, anywhere else I would be thinking to myself, well, what if the driver uh, gets off to go to the bathroom and he forgets to lock the bus door? Or, you know, what if somebody breaks a window or jimmies the door and gets in there and uh, that now my laptop is stolen? Um, I didn't worry about that at all because what became very apparent to me in, in, in sort of learning um, uh, about this desire of theirs to make sure that, that people have a good time, I get the sense that um, the amount of trouble a North Korean would get into for doing anything that would disturb a tourist would not be worth, uh, would not be worth whatever it was they wanted to do. Um, I, I have a feeling that if somebody did get on the bus and take my laptop, um, it'd be a hard life for them after that. So I felt very safe. Um, now, in North Korea, you're, you're with a group. It is possible to do small group tours there, uh, but I didn't opt to do that in part because I was there with a few, um, I was there with two other Americans that I knew. Uh, and uh, the group experience was substantially uh, less expensive than doing a, a smaller group uh, thing. So, um, you know, you're in this large group and you have uh, guides that are assigned to you and the guides work for the government. So 
you know, the bus driver works for the government, the, um, the guides work for the government, and they're, they're there for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons that they're there is to, to look out for you and to make sure you have a good time. And no matter how late it was, how badly lit it was, where in the city we were, I, I never for a moment worried for my safety once I figured out that um, that, was, that was the situation there. So I'm going to play a, just a little more of this video and then uh, transition to some uh, Iranian videos. So this is the holiday that I was mentioning, uh, Liberation Day, if I remember the correct name for it. But um, everybody just kind of goes out in the park and they dance and they cook out. And uh, if you get too close to some of these older ladies that you're seeing in the photos, uh, forget about it. You're going to get pulled into the dance circle and you're going to dance whether you like it or not. They will, uh, they will pull you right in. And uh, there is no saying no to a, a North Korean granny if she wants you to dance in the park. So. Um, I did have a very nice experience there, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, you know, some people have said that, um, that uh, these experiences are staged and, um, you know, they're not authentic. And I don't think that's true in part because of the sheer number of people you would need to pull something like that off. Um, and, you know, just from a common sense standpoint, people live in North Korea and they must do things for fun. So um, the idea that you would go to a park and see North Koreans uh, dancing and having a good time in a park, uh, I don't see why you, you would assume that that's some sort of staged production for your benefit. But there were people in our tour group that were uh, insistent that it was like a Truman Show kind of thing where um, everybody there was uh, basically an actor that was, um, that was, you know, ordered to be there. And um, I met a girl there and I didn't speak any North Korean and she didn't speak any English. And she was kind of looking at me and I mean, she was very cute. She was young and pretty. And, um, you know, when you're in a culture that's so different, um, you don't really know what people make of you, especially when you have an unusual look like I do. And, you know, someone looking at me in North Korea, I don't know if that means they're thinking like, wow, this guy must be really poor because it's the middle of summer and, and all he has to wear is that leather coat. He must be so hot. Um, he must be living in poverty if he doesn't have uh, some nice light clothes to wear. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know if they've ever seen a, a, a cowboy movie or a vampire movie or um, I did later learn some more about that, which we probably won't have time to get into. But so I don't know if this girl's looking at me because she thinks I'm I'm strange or you know she feels pity for me because i'm poor but soon enough she you know she starts kind of giving me the awkward smile and i'm giving her the awkward smile and her she's with an older relative probably a little too old to be mom but maybe an auntie or a grandma and the, the relative starts kind of elbowing her and nudging her towards me and um finally we're we're standing together the two of us and we just have no frame of reference to communicate. Um, we There's not a single word, you know. Uh, I, I think hello. I might have known hello, maybe. Um, and, you know, after a few minutes of, of just sort of standing there and, you know, smiling at each other, she her eyes light up and she reaches into her pocket and she pulls out a, a piece of candy. It's a hot summer day. The candy's been in her pocket all day, and it is an absolutely sticky, mushy mess of a piece of candy. And normally, 
you know, if I'm out and about, I don't like having sticky hands. And normally I would not get within a country mile of that piece of candy, but there was no way um, I was going to be disrespectful and refuse. So um, I ate the candy and I felt bad because I, I, there was nothing that I had to offer in return. And uh, just about the time that we were being summoned by the, by the guides to move on to the next stop, I recalled that there was someone in the tour group um, who both spoke some Korean and had a Polaroid camera with him. And I asked him to do me a favor. I brought him back over and um, I took a picture with the girl. And at first she was hesitant and I, I asked the guy to explain, no, no, the, the picture is for you. Like I'm leaving the picture with you. Um, this is my gift to you. And then she was really excited. So he took the picture and I gave it to her and she, you know, she was very, very excited about that. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if that was something that interested her for a few days or if she, you know, pinned it up on the wall in her, you know, her bedroom or her apartment or whatever her situation was. Um, I don't know. I'll never know. It's just, uh, you know, one of those ephemeral experiences that happens in the moment. And um, uh, that's its own story. You, you, you don't know um, if there's any more to the story and you never will. Um, but that was really, to me, um, my, my firm grounding in, in believing that, um, that, that everything that I was seeing, at least there in the park, um, was just real people doing real things, um, having a real day. So let's see if I can transition us to some video from Iran. All right, are you, are you guys hearing audio on this musical performance? Okay. So uh, that was in the city of Shiraz, and that was a private music show that I was uh, privileged enough to take part in, um, and uh, uh, was in a, a, a coffee house. And in Iran, um, a, f a fair number of coffee houses are in um, what used to be people's homes, and some of them are, are old homes, you know, 100, 200 years old. Um, and um, some of the homes that were owned by wealthier people, um, you know, you have a couple different rooms. You, you might have a, a, a one or two dining rooms and then a separate room for coffee and um, maybe a, a separate room for just sort of quiet conversations. So this was in um, one of those, those bigger establishments, but it was sort of like a private um, a back room. And it was the size of a, of a small living room. And the musicians, uh, the two ladies were um, on a couch uh, across from me. There was a table between us. I was on a different couch. Uh, the gentleman was on a chair um, at the head of the, the little table. Um, and it was as up close and intimate as you can get. And um, it was just a brilliant show. Um, I, and I, I'll bring the screen back up because I do want to, um, I do want to point out this instrument that he has here. Um, I think that I, I had probably seen it at some point before, um, but Iran was where I really fell in love with it. It's called the DAF, and uh, it's a, a, a handheld percussive drum. Um, 
not unlike a, an Irish bull run, except you, you play it with your hand, not with uh, sticks. Um, but um, the interesting thing about it is that in the back of the drum, behind the drum assembly, uh, there are, there's a, a crossbar in each direction, and there's a chain hung from it. And so you can play the drum as a percussive, the, the daf, you can play it as a percussive instrument, but as you're playing it or separately from playing it in that fashion, you can also shake it and the chains make their own musical sound. Um, and so it's, it's a, a dual purpose instrument and it's just got a great sound to it. Um, it's kind of like having a second musician um, when there's only one of you. So. Uh, after we had this show, I had the chance to hang out with these musicians for uh, about two hours, and uh, we had a little meal together and um, just talked about music and Iran and my life and their lives, and um, one of them was a tour guide, and she was learning Spanish, so we, we spoke briefly in Spanish, and one of them was a German teacher, so we spoke briefly in German, um, so that was nice. And um, uh, I remember that my, you know, my guide, um, uh, as as I was explaining the fact that the word in German for uh, little girl is uh, not feminine; it's not masculine; it's neuter. Um, and my guide's English is excellent but he was having a very hard time understanding this and the the german teacher had to explain it to him in farsi and he you know was still sort of like that that makes no sense and i said well you know most most languages have some things that don't make a whole lot of sense um and and certainly uh german and english are no exceptions there um but uh shiraz was was uh in my top two possibly my favorite city in Iran, uh, Isfahan being the other. Uh, Isfahan's very beautiful. There are some um, very historic and incredibly well-crafted mosques there. There's an enormous, enormous town square. Um, the different parts of the center of Isfahan are all connected by a covered bazaar so you can get from point to point without the sunlight touching you, which is very nice uh, if you're a vampire. Um, and uh, uh, Isfahan also has a, uh, a great um, tradition of singing uh, at night. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's certainly nice. Uh, I want to show another video clip of a performance in Iran. Say that, say 
So yes, in that particular group, all of the musicians were men. Um, and that was my last night in Iran. This is actually in Tehran. Uh, I didn't spend much time in Tehran because I wasn't, uh, there just wasn't a whole lot there that, that interested me as much as um, things in other parts of Iran that I really wanted to see. Um, so I spent a little time in Tehran, but, but much less than uh, than a tourist would normally do, and you know we tend to think of other countries as as monoliths. Um, you know we think of China and and um, you know it wasn't that that long ago that most Americans um, might ask you if you spoke Chinese, not realizing that there were something on the order of what is it. 30, 40, 50 different languages in China. Um, so um, even in a much smaller country than China, um, like Iran, there are regions and provinces and they have their own uh, traditions and their own uh, folklore and their own uh, things like that. And so these performers come from a part of Iran, uh, the region's called Baluchistan, if I remember correctly. Uh, again, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, but so for people in Tehran, um, this is this is different for them. This is an interesting um, uh, a cultural enrichment for them um, in much the same way that if you lived in Philadelphia or New York City, um, having some musicians from the Appalachians come to play traditional bluegrass music um, that might be interesting or exciting to you, or um, you know, so, someone come up and do some real Mississippi Delta blues uh, up here in Philly. That would be uh, exciting for us. So in the same way, uh, the Tehranis that came out to that show, um, that was uh, you know something far afield for them, something uh, from a from a different part of the country. Um, so. I got to as much live music as I could in Iran. Um, there's never enough for me, and especially um, a place like that that has such um, variety and, and such rich heritage and musical tradition going back uh, so, so long. Um, you know, there's never enough, but I did, I did get to see quite a bit. Um, there is a music museum that I went to, uh, and they had uh, a live show at the end of the tour of the museum, which I quite enjoyed. Uh, but I'll tell you a very quick funny story about an instrument that I saw there. Um, they have a, um, a type of guitar 
called a sitar. And of course, if you hear sitar, you think of Ravi Shankar and Indian music and that particular instrument, but it is not that instrument at all. A uh, sitar in Farsi uh, means three strings, and it was uh, it was a type of uh, three-stringed instrument, and um, so the name is very literal. But uh, maybe about a hundred to two hundred years ago, there's someone who was either a musician or a scientist, uh, couldn't quite get the story straight, maybe he was both, um, but he decided that the, the sound of the instrument would be greatly improved by the addition of a fourth string. And he was right. And so they started adding a fourth string to the instrument. So the name of the instrument literally means three strings and it's a four stringed instrument. So, um, Again, um, with any language, there are things that uh, just don't make sense. And uh, there you go. There's there's one one particular thing in Farsi that doesn't. So um, I've run a little over time for what I had planned to do for Travelog. Uh, I kind of wanted to get into doing some uh, music for you guys, which I will not be on camera for. Um, I suppose I should figure out what to put on the screen while I'm playing music for the next two hours, but uh, I'll, I'll just throw out and just see if anybody has a very quick um, last question. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you don't have a question, don't feel the need to come up with one. If you do, I will uh, try to take it now, but uh, failing that, I am going to see about getting some music started. Ah, thank you. It's my pleasure to share. Uh, didn't cover anywhere near as much ground as I thought I would. An hour goes by very quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, if people like this, we can certainly do it again some other time, talk about some different places. Um, now... What I might do is I might leave you with one more music clip while I try to get the DJing section sorted out. No, you know, that clip is so short that it's not worth the trouble. So this is probably going to, um, ah, well, um, uh, we'll probably talk more about Cuba next time. I, I have some pictures from there that I didn't get to show. So, um, well, you know, that's, that's really key. I mean, that's so key to travel is observe the local customs. And um, you just get so much more mileage out of any trip anywhere if you respect, you don't have to agree with local customs. You don't have to agree with everybody else's opinion. You just have to respect the customs and you have to respect that they have perhaps opinions, experiences, backgrounds, beliefs that are different from yours. You know, one of the things about Iran in particular, but anywhere I go, but especially Iran, was uh, I was mindful of wanting to be a good ambassador. Um, not just because it would enhance my travel experience, but, and not just as a weird person or a goth or whatever, um, you know, as someone from the West, I, I wanted to leave a good impression. And one of the best ways you can, you can do that is to, yes, exactly, immerse, immerse yourself, do what the locals do. Um, I got hooked on this this dish in Iran called faluda. It is a cold noodle dish. They serve it in the summertime. Uh, you eat it to help cool down. And it's made with extremely thin noodles, uh, almost like uh, vermicelli, um, or is it vermicelli? I don't know. Uh, but like very, very thin noodles. The noodles are so thin that you can actually drink faluda through a straw and the noodles will come up through the straw. That's how thin they are. Um, or if you prefer, you can eat it with a utensil. But uh, it's the uh, really thin noodles 
and uh, rose water. And uh, depending on where you are, um, meaning what part of the country you're in and what type of establishment you're in, they may put some local flowers, edible flowers in the faluda, and then it's served uh, ice cold and um, typically with some ice cubes and uh, uh, a fair, quite a fair bit of sugar. And so the sugar gives you energy and the um, uh, cold temperature of the dish helps cool you down on a, on a hot day, especially if you're out in the middle of the desert. Um, and uh, the rose water, just uh, rose water is such a wonderful thing. Um, oh, thank you. Um, rose water is, uh, is a beautiful thing. Uh, I wish I had more of that in my, uh, in my life. So um, anyway, um, I've definitely run long on the travelogue part. So thanks for watching. This.